conversation will go on for uh, an hour. Uh, I will start by introducing um, uh, Chris, and then we're going to have a deeper dive into uh, the book. Chris, uh, thanks so much for uh, being with us. Uh, Chris Miller is an associate professor of international history at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. He's also a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He is the director of the Eurasia Program and fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. This is a very impressive resume. Uh, Chris has previously served as the associate director of the Brady Johnson Program in Grand Tragedy at Yale University. He also was a lecturer at the New Economic School in Moscow, a visiting researcher at the Carnegie Moscow Center, and was also a research associate at the Brookings Institution. He has a PhD in history from Yale University, PA in history from Harvard University. Uh, Chris, this is again a very impressive resume. Thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Uh, I want to start by saying and, and saying the basis of your book. Your book, uh, uh, not only a fantastic contribution uh, to uh, the geopolitics of semiconductors, it walks us through the history and geopolitics of the semiconductor industry. Uh, it, it couldn't have been more timely with the Biden administration, uh, Ships and Science Act, uh, the IRA. Uh, the latest uh, decision and move to work with alliances such as Netherlands and uh, Japan to work on limiting Chinese access to uh, AI uh, uh, ships and semiconductors. I believe and others believe that your book not only lays intellectual and historical foundation of semiconductors industry, but it's very relatable. Uh, 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 readers, policymakers, uh, scientists, engineers, I, they all felt that your book were actually talking to everyone and was able to distill the, uh, uh, the semiconductor industry and the geopolitics and the buzz in a way that's very comprehensible. So I really appreciate the work you have done. I'm going to start by the first question that they have. You are a historian of Russia. Your, uh, your focus, your first three books uh, were all focused around Soviet Union, Soviet economy. So what drove you to uh, Right, the ship war. Well, well, first off, thanks, Mohammed, for the uh, invitation to join uh, you this morning to discuss uh, discuss these topics. I I am a historian of Russia, as you say, and I started out not planning to write a book on semiconductors. I was initially uh, planning to write a book on the evolution of defense technology during the Cold War, and the question that uh, puzzled me was why was it that during the early Cold War, both the U.S. and the Soviet Union could produce the key military technologies of that era, nuclear weapons, uh, long-range delivery systems, and in some certain categories, the, the Soviet Union actually got there first, like the first person in space, the first satellite uh, in space. But by the end of the Cold War, 30, 40 years later, the Soviet Union had fallen far, far behind, and in a whole suite of uh, uh, defense technologies, like long-range cruise missiles, for example, uh, the Soviets were really miles behind, decades behind. And, and that seemed like a puzzle because the Cold War arms race was central to the focus of both superpowers. The Soviets spent a lot of money. They'd been neck and neck in the race earlier on. They had lots of smart physicists. And so a lot of the ingredients that I thought uh, that would uh, be critical components into building an advanced uh, defense industrial base, the Soviets had, but they couldn't keep up. And so I started digging into this topic. I thought the answer was going to be in the evolution of specific military systems like fighter jets or missile systems. But what I quickly realized was that the, the key change wasn't in the evolution of any given military platform, but rather in a component of today, every military system, and that's computing power. And when I was doing that work, I learned that actually the first computer chips, semiconductors, emerged in the early Cold War uh, for missile guidance systems. And, and that pointed me towards the realization that in our histories of international power politics, we hadn't really grappled with the extent to which computing power provided by semiconductors had transformed uh, the military balance uh, over the past 75 years. And so that was really the origins of the book. Fantastic. I'm going to take you to the core of your book. Uh, could you spend a few minutes describing the importance of the semiconductors industry to the global economy today? I mean, we heard news during the shutdown, during COVID shutdown, about the, uh, the semiconductor shortage. So I think the audience will really be, uh, uh, it will be very helpful to the audience. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's actually the second question I started asking when I 
uh, began doing the research that I, I first learned that semiconductors had transformed the ways that militaries produce the equipment that they require. But then I came to realize that actually it wasn't only defense systems that had been transformed by computing power, it was everything. And if you just think about your daily life, although a typical person has never themselves bought a semiconductor because they're all embedded deep in electronic devices that we rely on. Uh, we, in fact, use thousands and thousands of chips every single day. So wake up in the morning and turn off your alarm clock. There's a semiconductor inside of there. Open your refrigerator. There's a semiconductor inside of there. Sit in your car. If you have a new car, it'll have a thousand semiconductors inside. So even before you turn on your phone or open your computer, you're relying on dozens and dozens of uh, semiconductors. And today, almost everything with an on-off switch, except for the simplest of light bulbs, has at least one and often dozens or hundreds of chips inside. And what we learned over the past several years of semiconductor shortage uh, was that it's not just the tech sector that requires computing power. It's basically everything. And one of the key takeaways of the, the shortage of the pandemic years was uh, that small shortages in even simple chips can cause hundreds of billions of dollars of disruption uh, to the world economy. And so the best example of this for the last several years was automakers who historically they thought of their supply chain as relating to uh, axles and motor parts and uh, not, the, not the chips in a car, but cars have more and more chips every single year. Some doing simple things like moving the windows up and down, others doing complex things like managing autonomous driving systems. But car makers faced a shortage of semiconductors the last couple of years. And even if they were just missing one chip out of the thousand that are in a new car, they couldn't produce the car. And so they suffered several hundred billion dollars worth of uh, sales that they weren't able to make because they were uh, facing a deficit of a, a small number of certain types of chips. And so that illustrated the extent to which there's not a single industry in the economy that today doesn't rely on a steady supply of semiconductors. So in your book, you talked about how the United States started the semiconductor industry and verbatim had monopoly over the industry, specifically in the 50s, 60s, peak uh, 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 Cold War competition with the Soviet Union. Um, how how United States, I'm not going to you, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say United States lost its own position, um, uh, but how we ended up with that level of concentration of semiconductor manufacturing in uh, East Asia, specifically TSMC. I think this is always the one main question. I want to hear your views on that. Yeah, no, it's 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 a key question right now, given the tensions between China and Taiwan. And so today, just to lay out the the the, the map of the supply chain, um, it's it's certainly true that there's enormous concentration of the production of processor chips in Taiwan. And today, TSMC, one Taiwanese company, which has almost all of its production today in Taiwan produces 90% of the world's most advanced processor chips, the types of chips that go in your phone, in many PCs, in data centers, in telecoms infrastructure. So there's huge concentration at the, the fabrication, the actual manufacturing stuff. And for other types of chips, there's also a lot of, fabric, uh, a lot of uh, concentration. So memory chips, for example, are very heavily concentrated uh, in South Korea. Um, but that's not the only part of the supply chain that's concentrated. If you start from the software tools that are needed to design chips, then go through the design of chips themselves and onto the machine tools that are needed to fabricate chips. At every step of the process, there's just a couple of firms, often in one or two countries, that are capable of producing um, components and tools with the requisite level of uh, precision uh, and sophistication. And that's happened for two reasons. First is that the chip industry involves enormous capital expenditures. So it, a new chip making facility can cost $20 billion. And there's just not that many uh, companies that can afford outlays uh, at that scale. Uh, the second is that there are huge economies of scale in the chip industry. Uh, and that has driven concentration at every single step of the supply chain. And, and the, the economies of scale come from two different factors. One is that um, just the, the financial outlays are so large uh, that you can only afford to make them if you're highly confident of success. And so it's existing firms that are able to invest in the next generation of technology and new startups or new entrants really struggle in the industry. But the second factor is that the amount of investment required to develop the technology um, is so large that once one or two companies have developed it, uh, it's just very difficult and expensive for a, a third or a fourth company to justify taking the same expense and winning a small share of a market that others have already uh, carved up. 
So at every stage of the chip making process, we see really heavily concentrated markets. So this is an excellent layout of the supply chain and semiconductors. Where are exactly the choke points that are facing the industry? And again, when we keep hearing about organization of choke points, what does it exactly mean in the context of the US-China competition? Well, if you start with the, the software tools that are used to design chips, there's uh, three companies that dominate the market for these software tools. And these are ultra complex software tools. A, a typical advanced semiconductor could have 15 billion transistors on it, 15 billion uh, electronic components that produce the ones and zeros undergirding all digital, uh, all digital computing. And so just to design a chip is extraordinarily complex. And so there are three companies that produce the, the chip design software at the cutting edge. And then actually the, the knowledge of how to do a design is also extraordinarily complex. And so for certain types of chips, there's just one or two firms often uh, that can actually undertake the relevant uh, design. So if you look, for example, at the design of uh, GPUs, graphics processor units, the chips that are used to train AI systems, there's just a couple of firms, uh, NVIDIA being the most important, that actually know how to design a chip at the cutting edge um, level. So there too, there's a, a ton of concentration in uh, chip design. When you go to the machine tools that are used to manufacture chips, there's even more concentration. Uh, and these tools are capable of uh, moving materials at almost the atomic level. Uh, which is needed to carve transistors into the chip in your smartphone, for example, which will have uh, 10 or 15 billion transistors, each one the size of a coronavirus. So this is the most complex manufacturing humans have ever taken. And the tools that are needed to do it uh, cost often $100 million a piece and are just extraordinarily complex machine tools. And in this segment, it's Japanese firms, American firms, and one Dutch firm called ASML. Uh, which have unique capabilities for certain types of the manufacturing process. There's deposition, lithography, etching, and there's different companies that specialize in each of these process steps. And unless you can access these tools, you can't make an advanced chip today. Uh, and so today, we, when we talk about Taiwan having extraordinary market share in manufacturing, that's absolutely true. Uh, but Taiwan has that market share because it's able to access materials, software, and uh, machine tools from the other parts of the supply chain. And so right now the US is trying to uh, consolidate the control of itself and its allies across these different choke points and cut China off from accessing them. This is fantastic. So I'm gonna take you to the question of Korea, Japan and Netherlands and, the, and specifically the idea of coordinating export control. So uh, Q4 last year, we had the Biden, Biden team coming up with export control lest that banning certain AI uh, uh, power chemicals going to uh, going to China. And also the assumption in DC that our allies and partners will bandwagon and they will be okay with that sort of export control. We had the Dutch prime minister coming to DC, give a speech, and had a handshake with the president. Uh, we also assumed that Prime Minister Kishida when he was also in DC a few, few months ago, he will also bandwagon. However, Recently, we started to hear in the news that there's some sort of dissatisfaction with the decision, uh, that there was a lack of coordination, uh, it, they were taken by surprise, and we might not have uh, that level of commitments from Korea, Japan. I know Korea was not really part of the initial decision, I know that. However, what do you think about that? Well, how do you evaluate that sort of unfolding complex, uh, uh, many countries involved in that sort of uh, US decision? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and it'll be a fascinating issue to track over the next uh, couple of years. I, I think first off, to, to set the stage for the difficulties that export controls like this face, you can look back to the Cold War when the U.S., Western Europe, and Japan imposed restrictions on the transfer of certain types of industrial machinery and computers to the Soviet Union. And one of the, the trends in those controls was that there was a very high incentive for uh, countries or individual companies to defect from the controls, to illegally or legally try to sell equipment, because if it was banned from other countries, there was actually a lot of money to be made from one country or one company um, breaking, the, breaking the controls. And so that dynamic is certainly going to be present um, in the imposition of, of these controls. Now, I think there are um, two other factors that, that push in the opposite direction. Um, the first is that right now, the types of equipment and software that's being controlled is very highly concentrated. And so we're talking really about two or three companies that can produce most of the relevant equipment that's being controlled. 
And so the question of enforcement is more straightforward when there's just a couple of companies involved because you know exactly where to look if you want to understand whether the rules are being followed or not. I think related to that uh, is the fact that the equipment in question is not the type of tool that you can sell once and forget about. All of these tools uh, come with service agreements that um, persist over the lifetime of the tool. Uh, they come with spare parts requirements. And it's often the case that the companies that manufacture the tools are the only ones that are capable of uh, providing the spare parts at the requisite level of quality. And so the machine tool companies, they know with 95% or often 98% accuracy, the current location of tools they sold 30 years ago, because they're still servicing those tools. And because their customers know that the customers can't service the tools without help from the companies that made them. And so the, 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 the service relationship is actually key. It's not just a, a sale. It's a, a one-off. It's a long-standing relationship, which again, makes it harder to uh, to violate the export control rules because it's easy to find out where the tools end up. Second factor is that you know, I think in, in the U.S. there's um, a lot of focus on, on what we describe as U.S.-China competition, which is, uh, which is an accurate description and, and fair enough from the U.S. perspective. But if you're sitting in other countries, uh, there's also other countries' relationship with China, all of which have deteriorated. Uh, I think if you look at Japan, you know, one of the striking trends of the last uh, 12 months is that a ostensibly pacifist country has decided to double its defense spending as a share of GDP precisely so that they can buy long range strike systems that can reach deep into China. Uh, this is a transformation in Japanese defense policy. And, you know, to put this into context, the US has been requesting that Japan increase defense spending for half a century with zero success until this year. And so, in the context, and, and obviously Japan is doing this uh, precisely because of the concerns about China. And so in the context of Japan's decision to double defense spending, the decision to join export controls is really a, that's a, that's a small decision relative to uh, what's happening in, in Japanese security policy. And so I think when you look at what allies are doing, um, their own policies towards China have hardened dramatically in a way that makes it much easier to get buy-in for these types of controls. The Netherlands is another interesting case study. Uh, just last week, the Netherlands released its uh, updated national security strategy. And right now there's of course a war going on in Europe where Russia is attacking Ukraine, but the Dutch security strategy listed China next to Russia as a core threat to Dutch security, which I think is really striking given the Russia-Ukraine war that the Dutch uh, framed it in that way. And so I think when we look at the export controls, there's no doubt that the US was the first mover, uh, but I think if you want to understand uh, why it is that these controls uh, emerged, you've also got to take into account that in all the other key countries, and we can talk about Korea, Taiwan as well. Uh, there have been really transformations in those countries' views of the relationship with China in security terms and also in economic terms that have made export controls much, much more palatable than they would have been even five years ago. I couldn't agree more. I was, I was in Tokyo a uh, few few months ago, uh, actually in March, and the general sense I got from policymakers and defense strategists would completely align with what you're talking about. There's a sense of urgency. There's a sense that we need to step, step up our defense capabilities. Really clear from the, their defense strategy, the military buildup plan. Uh, so absolutely. There's also some sort of agency for these allies and partners when it comes to the question of China. My question to you, is it fair to assume that the U.S. Uh, export control uh, slash pan on uh, exporting semiconductors to China is part of a broader tech containment? And if it's such, do you think that this is enough? Uh, of course, I'm going to, we're going to talk about the Expo, uh, uh, the Ships Act, but I'm very interested in, in in your own perspective about tech containment, the trajectory. What's next after semiconductors? Is semiconductors going to be the last technology the United States is going to ban? If not, what's next? Yeah, no, it's, it's only a question that's on, on the minds of many in, in Washington. I, th I think it's interesting to note that Last year, um, Alan Estevez, the, who runs the, um, uh, the Bureau of Industry and Security in the Department of Commerce, he's in charge of export controls, um, publicly said that uh, if he had to bet, he would bet that he'd be imposing more export controls on different segments of technology, on biotech, on AI, on quantum. And that hasn't really happened yet. Um, we, we haven't seen major moves in these years. We see ongoing discussion, but nothing uh, nearly as dramatic as what we've seen in semiconductors. And I think there's a reason for that. 
uh, which is not that the U.S. government doesn't take these other areas seriously, but that the structure of the chip industry makes it much, much easier uh, to politicize or weaponize in the ways the U.S. has, uh, simply because there are a smaller number of choke points, and they're basically today all in the hands of the U.S. or a, a small ha handful of like-minded uh, countries. And so I think we should expect more movement on advanced technology from the U.S. government and other governments, um, but I don't think it will be nearly as easy to set up an export control regime for other technologies just because they don't have the concentration uh, that lets you um, let you impose export controls in the manner the U.S. Uh, has vis-a-vis uh, -vis semiconductors. I think the, the other aspect is that in the chip industry, it was very straightforward um, to explain to allied governments what the relationship was between chips, training AI systems, between AI systems being deployed to defense intelligence uses. And although most of most civilians think of computers as being about you know, smartphones or, or computer games or, or surfing the internet, uh, governments for the past 75 years have thought of computing in no small part uh, uh, in relation to its defense intelligence capabilities. And so going to other governments uh, and saying, uh, controlling the foundation of computing power is critical to defense and intelligence uh, applications was something that governments uh, were receptive to because they were aware of the extent to which their own capabilities were dependent on advanced computing. Uh, and I think for other technologies, it's, it's less clear of a linkage. Take biotechnology. On the one hand, everyone knows there are real biosecurity risks. On the other hand, uh, there's great concern, justifiably so, for taking any sort of steps that would limit medical research. Uh, and with semiconductors, there was just a much clearer link between the types of chips that are being banned and the types of capabilities that uh, defense ministries around the world are looking to deploy. If you have a crystal ball, let me take that back. If you're in the position... Because, I don't have a crystal ball, so... <laughs> Fair enough. If you're in a position to advise policymakers in emerging markets in the context of tech decoupling, tech competition, what would be your what would be one point of advice? Well, you know, I, I think the the phrase tech decoupling is a is an interesting one. I think an important one to um to to discuss here. We've heard over the last month or so a, a number of Western policymakers in Europe and in the U.S. Uh, push back against the concept of decoupling and embrace phrases like de-risking instead. We've heard that from Ursula von der Leyen in Europe. Um, we've heard that in speeches from uh, Janet Yellen and Jake Sullivan in the U.S. Um, just yesterday, I was on a panel with two mem members of Congress, both of whom embraced the concept of using a scalpel rather than a sledgehammer to reform U.S. tech and economic relations with China. And so there's a lot of people who, uh, in positions of power, uh, who would like, I think, to have only minor changes to the tech relationship. Um, I think the, the challenge to uh, the scalpel rather than sledgehammer approach is that it doesn't take into account, first off, how the private sector already is responding, uh, and second, how China will respond. Um, the, the scalpel versus sledgehammer assumes that there's only one actor, when in fact there are many actors and not all of them are thinking in the same way uh, as, as Western governments. And I think what we see right now are, are, are two other dynamics that are happening in our uh, driving much larger changes in tech supply chains than uh, Western governments necessarily intended. The, the first is that companies across the electronics industry are really dramatically shifting their investment patterns, uh, trying to much more rapidly than before set up a China-focused supply chain and a non-China-focused supply chain. And this is going to have implications for the chip industry, but also downstream all of the electronics components all the way to the assembly process that go into smartphones, servers, PCs, et cetera. And right now, much of the assembly and much of the simpler electronic components are produced in China. But I think that's going to shift fairly rapidly over the coming years with countries like Vietnam, India, Mexico, uh, and others uh, benefiting. And so that's driven by corporate decision-making, corporate boardrooms looking at the trend lines, assessing risk, and saying that they want more diversification in where they're assembling um, devices or where they're sourcing components. The second dynamic is, is the way China's responding. And I think we're going to see uh, China responding but becoming much more protectionist in its electronics industry. You know, right now, uh, unlike most segments of the Chinese economy, there's not yet been a substantial amount of pressure for Chinese companies to buy Chinese-made components in electronics. So if you look at a Chinese-made Chinese assembled smartphone, like an Oppo or a Vivo brand, all of the high value components, all the chips will be imported from Japanese, 
uh, Korean Taiwanese firms. I think that's going to change. And as that changes, that will add pressure to the decoupling because China is going to be pushing for a China focused supply chain and other firms from other countries will respond by re-emphasizing, redoubling their efforts on a non-China focused supply chain. So what does that mean? It means that even if Western policies want the scalpel rather than the sledgehammer, we're going to get changes that are bigger uh, than they intend. And that creates risks and opportunities for, for third countries. And the opportunity is clear that there's a lot of the electronics industry that is going to be looking for new geographies over the coming years. And uh, places like India, Southeast Asia, and others uh, are, are pitching themselves as locations for um, electronics assembly and also for the production of many of the, the components that go into things like smartphones or PCs. But it also creates risks because I think we should expect the more bifurcated um, uh, uh, world economy when it comes to certain types of supply chains with electronics being chief among them. And electronics are one of the most widely uh, traded uh, goods, similarly in autos, which are increasingly a tech product. We're seeing more bifurcation uh, in auto markets uh, as well. And so for emerging markets, this also creates risks that the bifurcation is politically destabilizing, but also that it drives up costs. And that's going to be a key question is how much of a cost premium will have to be paid for companies that are moving production outside of China. I'm going to take you back to the United States. So we talked about tech containment. You give an excellent overview of export control, coordination, alliance, also the uh, relationship between China and some of the tech powerhouses. It seems like the strategy is building the U.S. capability in semiconductors. We have seen the bipartisan support for the Ships Act. So now I know it's already enough time as a trained engineer. I know it takes time. But what are the metrics that we should use? to know if the CHIPS Act is working or not? Well, I think if you ask that question to the U.S. Commerce Department, which is the part of the government that's implementing the CHIPS Act, um, they would point you to um, looking at the share of the amount of investment happening uh, in the U.S. chip industry, which has indeed increased. And then their hope is that over the next five to 10 years, uh, that will lead the U.S. to win back market share when it comes to the manufacturing of semiconductors. And U.S. market share over the last 30 years has decreased dramatically. Uh, 30 years ago, the U.S. produced around a third of the chips manufactured globally. Today, it's closer to 10 percent. And so the, the, the CHIPS Act is partially intended to uh, increase that figure uh, uh, over time. Now, it's not going to get back to 30 percent, I don't think, under any circumstance, but it, it will be higher uh, thanks, to the, thanks to the CHIPS Act. I think the second facet is that uh, U.S. policymakers, until very recently, could tell themselves, well, our market share is declining, but we still produce the most advanced semiconductors at home. And now, as we've discussed, that's no longer true with TSMC in Taiwan being the most advanced producer. And the U.S. also wants, as a result of the CHIPS Act, to have more cutting edge production in the U.S. And some of that will come from companies like TSMC and Samsung building new facilities in the U.S. Uh, there's also um, uh, a race in the industry between TSMC, Samsung, and Intel, a U.S. firm, to see who can develop the, the next generation uh, uh, technologies more rapidly. And so there's a chance the CHIPS Act could also help to shape uh, how that race uh, developed. There's a lot of focus uh, on, on these leading edge shipping technologies that is guiding uh, the, the Commerce Department as it implements these goals. I think what we're, what we're not going to see and what policymakers don't want to see is self-sufficiency. And we've heard the Commerce Department be very, very explicit that self-sufficiency is not the goal, that chips funds are open to companies from other countries, uh, and that the chip industry will remain internationally integrated, bringing together the U.S., Europe, Japan, Korea, uh, and Taiwan. And I don't think there's, um, you, know, you can certainly find some members of Congress who will talk about self-sufficiency in the chip industry, but I don't think there's anyone who seriously worked on this issue in the government or, or even in Congress who believes that self-sufficiency is the goal. And so um, I, I think the the emphasis on working with allies and partners is, is really a critical facet of how the CHIPS Act has been shaped. Uh, and I think would be critical to its success because self-sufficiency is really a hopeless goal uh, in the semiconductor industry. So it, it seems to me it is much more of an insurance policy than uh, uh, ensuring all the uh, semiconductors manufacturers in the United States. Yeah. So the core is more about innovation and trying to maintain leading positions in semiconductors. So that would take me to a very another 
question that might be political. Do we have the human talent, the human pipeline that can support that sort of effort to build back these sort of capabilities? I mean, we have read the news, a New York Times story about some of the difficulties that facing TSMC, finding certain talent uh, working for this new production facility uh, in Arizona. So do you think we have that sort of talent? Also, what, what could we do uh, uh, to avoid that sort of shock point that we have? You know, I think if you ask anyone in the chip industry to list countries in the world by the number of skilled personnel working in the chip industry, the U.S. would come first in, in any metric. Um, now, when it comes to the specific manufacturing segment of the supply chain, um, the U.S. would uh, be a close competitor with Taiwan and Korea um, for that specific segment. Um, but the U.S. chip industry is, is the world's largest when you look across the supply chain. Uh, and so I think the U.S. starts with a really enviable position when it comes to human capital. Um, now, that doesn't mean that there's work to be done to uh, make sure in certain segments of the supply chain where there hasn't been as much investment in the past, there uh, need to be pipelines from universities to um, companies that are providing the requisite types of skills. Uh, it also doesn't mean that uh, there is a cost differential between workers in the U.S. and workers in Taiwan and Korea. Uh, U.S. workers demand higher wages uh, and they have other options. Um, one of the big challenges the chip industry in the U.S. has faced is that uh, in the U.S., uh, for many types of skill sets, you can either go work at a chip company or you can go work at Google and Facebook. Uh, in Taiwan, there is no Google and Facebook. And so uh, TSMC doesn't have to pay as high salaries uh, in, in, in Taiwan as it might have to pay uh, in, in the US. So labor costs are, are part of the equation. But if you look at an advanced shipmaking facility today, over the lifetime of the plant, 70% of the cost is in the machine tools that go inside of it. Those tools cost the same anywhere in the world. So the only thing that can be differential in cost is the other 30%, which is the construction of the building, the workforce, the land cost, the water cost, the energy costs. Uh, and those are, are lower generally in places like Taiwan uh, than in the U.S., but a lot of those issues are also issues that policy can address by um, providing more incentives, for example, by making sure we're not charging exorbitant rates for uh, energy and, and for water. And so when I look at the, the cost differential and, and the workforce component of that, I I, I don't worry as much as some of the New York Times headlines uh, might uh, might necessarily suggest. I think that where it's more complex to compete with Taiwan uh, is on uh, on issues like land cost, like tax policy. Um, those are the areas where the U.S. Uh, struggles. Final issue is permitting. Um, there's there's great studies that have been done about how long it takes to build a semiconductor facility, uh, and the U.S. is the worst in the world. Not only worse than Taiwan and Korea, uh, worse than Europe too, uh, which is of course not known for its light touch regulation. And so this is a really key issue that the U.S. has got to deal with um, if it wants to remain competitive uh, in semiconductor manufacturing. Speaking of Europe, I'm going to take you international again. As you know, a few few days ago, a few weeks ago, the EU is thinking about their own Chips Act. How do you see that in the context of U.S. China? Uh, tech de-risking, uh, is it an ad or is it a potential competition for the United States? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? You know, I, I think it's a good thing from the perspective of the U.S. Uh, it's a good thing from the perspective of um, Japan. I, the reason is that there won't be a lot of direct competition um, between what the EU ends up funding and what the U.S. ends up funding. Most of the U.S. CHIPS Act funds are, are going to go to leading edge manufacturing and logic and in memory chips which is not what the EU is going to fund. Um, from what it, what it looks like right now, and not everything is set, uh, EU member states will be able to choose what they, um, what they decide to support. And I think most of the member states uh, will uh, choose to support uh, not the most cutting edge chip making in terms of processor chips, but rather chip making that goes into the automobile industry, for example, or certain types of sensors or uh, communications chips, chips for electric vehicles. Uh, and these are areas where there needs to be new capacity because the electric vehicle transition will demand uh, many more chips that are specialized for electric vehicles. Um, and where there's not, I don't think, nearly as much direct competition between uh, US and, and European firms. So I actually don't worry that much about, um, about a subsidy race between the US and Europe. The, the subsidy race that's really happening is, is between China and the rest of the world, um, because China is spending as much money on subsidies as the rest of the world combined. I think the, the ballpark way to think about it is that China has been spending a Chips Act a year every year since 2014, 
And the capacity that China is building out right now is in low-end, non-differentiated, non-specialized shipmaking, which will compete with existing firms everywhere else in the world, in Taiwan, in Korea, in the US, and in Europe. And so that's the subsidy race we've got to worry about. It's also the subsidy race that we have basically no effective policy tools to address. You're a history of Russia, and we talked about China all the time. I think I have a question for you when it comes to Russia. The Russian economy was crippled by U.S. sanctions, have limited to limited access to advanced semiconductors that can help guiding their missiles. What's the evaluation of the status in Russia? Uh, do you think they're able to build a domestic uh, alternative? Uh, are they able to get um, uh, access to certain semiconductors from China? It's very, I think it's normally talks about it, so I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts on it. Yeah, so the, the, the Russian chip industry uh, is uh, very, very, very far behind the cutting edge. Um, many generations behind what China can produce domestically and very small. Uh, traditionally, it's focused almost exclusively on the Russian um, defense industrial base and space um, companies. Um, and the, the, the semiconductor industry in Russia has probably faced, we don't really have great data, a lot of it's classified in Russia, but it's probably faced um, really dramatic disruptions from the Western sanctions that have been imposed uh, over the last 15 months. However, um, Russia has dramatically increased its imports of semiconductors from China. Um, and China is not capable of producing the most cutting edge chips, but it's capable of producing a lot of chips. And Russia has stepped up its actions uh, with regard to smuggling in chips from third countries. And so if you think about defense systems, um, like, a, like a new car, which will have lots and lots of not very sophisticated chips and a small number of sophisticated chips, defense systems are sort of similar. They need lots of, of not sophisticated chips and then certain more sophisticated chips for certain types of advanced processing or sensors or communication. And so for, for, for not very sophisticated chips, it's easy to buy them because they're widely available in almost every country in the world. And so Russia is going to have no problem smuggling in um, non-cutting edge ships from third countries. And we've seen plenty of evidence that they're doing so. Uh, there's been some great studies done of Russian military equipment that's been captured in Ukraine, taken apart, and there's uh, foreign microelectronics found inside. Um, but these are chips that are generally pretty widely developed. Um, you, you might have heard uh, anecdotes of Russia stripping semiconductors out of dishwashers to put in military equipment. You know, I don't know if that's true or not, um, but that speaks to the fact that there's a lot of chips that are widely used in dishwashers and in military equipment. And those are the types of chips that we're not going to be able to stop Russia from getting access to. There's a lot of dishwashers in the world. However, um, there are certain types of chips used in defense systems uh, that are not nearly as widely as available. Certain types of communications, certain types of sensors. And these are the areas where there's a smaller number of producers in the West um, and where we've got a better chance of causing problems in Russia's uh, acquisitions, efforts, and supply chains. We won't be perfect. We know from the Cold War that uh, Russia was very good at smuggling in uh, semiconductors. Um, but we also know from the Cold War that success doesn't necessarily mean cutting off Russia's access entirely. Even if you're able to just cause disruptions to the supply chain, you're able to cause delays in the production of uh, military equipment. And it's hard to find really credible data that would let us assess um, the extent to which delays are being caused because Russia obviously doesn't release data on its defense industrial base. Um, but I think it stands to reason that um, the, the, the export controls are causing um, some delays uh, in, in Russian defense production, even though they're certainly not catastrophic enough to prevent Russia's ongoing war effort. That's fantastic. I have, I have one question that also comes in mind, which is basically since we're talking about Russian, Russian defense uh, strategy and defense capabilities, the question of Silicon Shield. Uh, I know you talked about it many times before. Um, our audience, who many of them are based in the Middle East, I think it's very important uh, for me to ask this question. Do you think it's a valid assumption uh, uh, that uh, that will act as deterrence? What's the future of semiconductor industry in case of a, a Chinese attempt to annex or occupy Taiwan? So I I think we should be skeptical about the Silicon Shield. I, I think when Taiwanese policymakers embrace the idea of a Silicon Shield, they're thinking of the following scenario. 
Uh, thousands of Chinese ships and troops stream across the Taiwan Straits. It looks like D-Day version 2.0, and the rest of the world has to respond, come to Taiwan's aid because of Taiwan's critical role in shipmaking. And more than that, China's probably deterred from that type of attack because China knows that if they were to launch a massive uh, attack on Taiwan, it would knock out the Jamaican facilities and cause huge disruptions, not only for the rest of the world, but also for China, which is equally reliant on chips made in Taiwan. If you think that D-Day version 2.0 is the most likely scenario, then I think the Silicon Shield makes sense. But I don't think D-Day version 2.0 is the most likely scenario because if I was sitting in Beijing, I would, and I decided that I wanted to take Taiwan over a short time horizon, I would try to take steps that were below the threshold of what would induce a certain U.S. response. That's the low-cost way to take Taiwan, to try to uh, begin to, uh, to coerce Taiwan, to impose pressure on Taiwan uh, in ways that it's not obvious would trigger uh, a U.S. response to coming to Taiwan's aid. So, for example, envision a blockade. I think you can uh, imagine many scenarios in which a blockade would start. Um, but if China were to start imposing customs checks, for example, on ships going into Taipei, Taiwan's ports, uh, it would present a real challenge for the U.S. to respond. Uh, Taiwan couldn't withstand a blockade that lasted more than a couple of days or weeks. Uh, it needs to import food, energy, uh, all sorts of manufactured goods from abroad. And uh, as we learned during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, blockades are very effective political tools because they force the other side to decide, do you want to shoot first? That was the impact of, the, uh, of John F. Kennedy's blockade of Cuba. It posed to Khrushchev the question, do you want to shoot first? And Khrushchev decided, no. In an example of a Chinese blockade, we would face the question, do you want to shoot first? And shooting first wouldn't only raise the risk of war, it would also be guaranteed to create massive disruptions to electronic supply chains. And so the US president would face a choice, do you do nothing? Or do you do something and guarantee dramatic disruptions to the world economy, huge economic costs, uh, a factory shut down worldwide because you've uh, started a conflict in the middle of the uh, world's most congested shipping lanes that also include um, uh, the world's most advanced semiconductors. And so in that scenario, I actually think that Taiwan's critical role in chip production makes it harder for a U.S. president to come to Taiwan's aid. And therefore, the Silicon Shield actually ends up not deterring China in a blockade scenario. I think it ends up deterring us from coming to Taiwan's aid. And so I think in the scenario that matters, the scenario that's the most likely and the scenario that's the hardest for us to deal with, Taiwan's critical role in chip production is not an asset. It's a major liability because we're going to be less willing to bear the economic cost that helping Taiwan would involve. In I know you you were in Asia too recently, and I know that you have been raising these issues with uh, Taiwanese uh, intellectuals and policymakers. What's their response? What's what's their thoughts about it? What's their basically strategy uh, in case of a contingency in terms of the semiconductors industry? Well, I think for for Taiwan, um, the chip industry is not only politically significant; it's also economically critical. Uh, 40% of Taiwan's exports are semiconductors. Uh, so Taiwan has plenty of economic reasons to want to keep its ship industry very vibrant, which I completely uh, understand. And Taiwanese leaders need to think not only about the worst case scenario, but also need to have a viable economy in the not worst case scenarios as well. And so that's why the chip industry is something that Taiwanese leaders want to cultivate and continue uh, to support. Um, but I think that neither Taiwan nor the US has thought seriously enough about a blockade scenario. I don't think we've got a good answer to a blockade. Uh, and I worry that in a blockade scenario, that the clock starts ticking very, very quickly. Uh, there's, not there's not very long uh, in terms of time horizon before Taiwan starts to run out of critical goods uh, that it requires. And so I worry that uh, we haven't done enough to prepare for that type of scenario. Uh, and then if it happens, uh, we will find ourselves floundering, uh, struggling to devise an effective response. I exhausted all my questions, and I have to thank you for just having these fantastic answers to a very expensive and wide ranging of, of questions. I have two questions from the audience, and then I'm going to give you a, a few minutes at the end for you to express, to give your um, your notes and your remarks, if you have. So, one of the one of the questions we have 
what are the focal incentives for mobilizing U.S. alliance to the United States approach to the semiconductor industry? Well, I, I think you know we, we discussed the extent to which, for certain U.S. allies, there's been a similar trajectory and views towards tech competition with China, um, and so that has made mobilizing them much less politically difficult because they've undertaken a similar intellectual trajectory uh, than many U.S. policymakers have. And so when you look at Japan, uh, when you look at certain European countries, not all, but certain ones, uh, you'll find really dramatic shifts in views on China uh, over the last uh, several years. I think the second facet is that we discussed ways that corporate leaders are on their own taking decisions that are reshaping tech supply chains. And the fact that corporate leaders are already beginning to expect major changes in tech supply chains, they're beginning to expect more bifurcation, uh, and they're beginning to expect um, a China-focused sphere and a non-China-focused sphere uh, shaping the way they do business in the future, means that they're less resistant uh, to policy changes that also move in that direction because they're already making business decisions on that assumption. So five years ago, uh, it was hard to convince tech CEOs or electronic CEOs that uh, more bifurcation was coming, but today they all think more bifurcation is coming. And so when governments take steps to push in that direction, CEOs aren't surprised by that. They're already planning for that new world. And so in the corporate world as well, there's been much less resistance than I think one might have expected uh, to the types of measures that, uh, that push towards this bifurcated uh, tech uh, system. And the third aspect is that the way the U.S. has designed the export controls it's imposed imposes uh, just as substantial costs on U.S. firms as it does on firms in allied countries. Uh, it's U.S. firms like NVIDIA or AMD that are restricted from the uh, rules that limit transfers of GPUs to China. It's U.S. firms like Applied Materials or LAM Research that are restricted by the rules that limit equipment transfers to China. And so it's simply not plausible to say these rules hurt foreign firms more than they hurt U.S. firms. In fact, I think it's the opposite. They hurt U.S. firms more than they hurt foreign firms. And so the U.S. can credibly go to uh, allied countries and say, we're doing burden sharing because our companies are being hurt too. And if you look at the impact of the controls on companies across the industry, I think you find actually a, a reasonably equitable division of pain between U.S. firms, Japanese firms, Dutch firms, uh, Korean firms, which nobody likes for understandable reasons. Um, all of the companies are unhappy with, um, but they all also realize that the fact that the pain is distributed somewhat evenly makes the system more durable over the long run. And so they've all got to work with it um, because no country, no company has enough of an incentive to uh, defect from this coalition. And so I think that's a third uh, critical factor is that the, the controls have been designed in a way to spread uh, the burden or spread the pain. Uh, of, of um, the lost sales to China that, that they involve. And so all these factors, I think, uh, have been relevant in explaining why it is that the export control regime has been set up, and I think so quickly and, and with relatively little arm twisting from the U.S. side when it comes to having to put substantial pressure on allies to sign up. The final question from the audience is, what advice do you have for semiconductor suppliers caught in the middle of the U.S.-China competition who do not want to big size. I, it seems like they have to big size, but if you have advice, please leave it. Let us know. Well, I, I, think, I think basically every semiconductor company in the world falls into this category. Uh, none of them want big size, even U.S. firms, even Chinese firms, because for U.S. firms, China is a critical customer in many cases, and for Chinese firms, the U.S. is a critical technology supplier. So the chip industry didn't want any of this. Uh, the chip industry was surprised by the politicization of, uh, of industrial policy uh, over the past uh, uh, five to seven years. The chip industry resisted it uh, in many ways. But I think now the entire world chip industry has come to realize that this is a new reality in which they have to do business. Uh, and so I think most chip firms are trying not to pick sides, trying to keep market access to both the China and the non-China markets uh, where they can. Um, to make clear that they are being responsive to government regulations, but that otherwise they're trying to sell wherever they can sell. But also chip firms are being realistic, I think, much more so than five years ago, about the likely future trajectory of regulation. 
And they're beginning to already make plans, assuming more bifurcation between the China and non-China markets. And they're redevising their supply chains uh, to minimize uh, their reliance on Chinese-made components for non-China markets and vice versa. Um, and so, so I, I think this reality is, is a reality that every uh, semiconductor firm is facing. Um, they're hoping that the politics doesn't push them towards further bifurcation, but they're also expecting, I think, that regulation will continue to push them in this direction uh, for the years to come. Fantastic. This is your chance, in case there's any question I missed asking you, for you to respond to it. What question should you have asked? I didn't ask, and what would be the response to this? Well, I think we've we've covered uh, lots of of ground. The only issue that we didn't dive into in detail, which I think is is um, quite relevant right now, is the the central role of semiconductors in uh, artificial intelligence systems, which we alluded to. Um, but as the generative AI boom continues, the demand for computing power is only increasing. And I think one of the key data points that explains um, the tech sector today is that the amount of data needed to train a cutting edge AI system is doubling every six to nine months, according to research by Epic AI, which is one of the best outfits for AI research. Whereas per Moore's law, the amount of computing power in a chip doubles every two years, which means that we're gonna face a deficit of computing uh, when it comes to training AI, AI systems for the foreseeable future. And computing will remain a limiting factor in our ability to train AI systems. And so when we think about uh, uh, chat GPT or all the other uses of uh, the new AI models that are coming out, uh, we also need to recognize that they're trained on extraordinary large numbers of chips in ultra advanced data centers. And these chips are produced by just a couple of firms. And so the concentration of the chip industry uh, is not only relevant for the semiconductor industry itself, it's also playing a role in how um, the, the new wave of uh, generative AI systems are being trained and who has the capabilities in terms of access to chips to train them. Yeah. Chris, really, I'm thankful for your time. I know you're very busy. You have a very busy schedule. Uh, I know you travel all the time. So I really appreciate that level of since you We're very honored to have you with us today. That was such a very enlightening conversation from the United States, Taiwan, to Russia, to China. Uh, again, all the insights, really appreciate it. And the audience really appreciate your, your insights. So thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. And to the audience, uh, thank you for tuning in today uh, from wherever you are. Please stay tuned. We have uh, more events to come. Please check our, uh, our webpage.